I will let the floor now to some questions. Just to organize that round of questions, I will let the floor first to our three colleagues on board, Sophie, uh, Livia, and uh, Clementina. Uh, and then a final word of question and conclusion by Patrick and our two directors, uh, Claudia uh, and Jan. I will just let the floor first to Sophie Kwasny. She's head of Data Protection Unit. I'm sure that uh, the last word of uh, Adrien, of course, raised a, a lot of questions. And just for the answer to our expert, I propose uh, to use exactly the same order than your intervention. Michael could, could answer first, then Dino, and finally Adrien. Sophie, uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. Good morning to all. Buongiorno, bonjour. Uh, fascinating points have been uh, have been made by uh, each of you. Um, so, for the sake of time, uh, because I, I saw some of you reacted to the other uh, messages, uh, I will just uh, highlight very briefly the relevance of the work that the Council of Europe is doing in that field, uh, in the field of privacy, in the field of data protection. Adrien, you did mention uh, Convention 108. Uh, do you know uh, this analogy with the firemen is really uh, touching and true? And it's also true that if it's unprecedented times and uh, the fact that the firemen now can use the data, and we've seen it, we've seen highlights about the fact that uh, personal data helps uh, save life this time, this is new. How do we achieve this without uh, damaging what we have been building for decades. Uh, for decades, the Council of Europe has been uh, uh, trying to find the right balance, precisely respecting uh, the right to data protection and the right to privacy, and preserving other fundamental interests. Uh, lately, in the modernization of our convention, uh, we've put for new principles. Uh, Adrien also mentioned the DPIA, data protection impact assessments, but also privacy by design. And everything that Michael has been presenting and Dino too is a perfect illustration of privacy by design, privacy by default. Uh, so it's really marvelous to see uh, this illustration. What I also want to highlight about the relevance of the work of the Council of Europe and the Convention is just like the virus, the coronavirus, it knows no frontiers. And so the work that we are doing on data protection, which is a work of global relevance, is used in all regions of the world, and this is fundamental. Uh, it's fundamental uh, technically in terms of the interoperability, like the one that Mike mentioned, but also legally speaking. And so the chair of the Committee of Convention 108 and our Data Protection Commissioner adopted jointly a declaration on the 30th of March, which you can find online, but recalling the key principles. And what was great was to see that we had African countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries fighting the coronavirus, saying how those principles were important for them. So my question, um, a lot has been said, um, but just to come back to the privacy by design and privacy by default, which is the core of the application tracking app that are now being developed, um, I would like to know what you consider as experts, but also as a lawyer, as really the key privacy enhancing uh, capacities and features of this system. What is really crucially needed for the population and each of us to really uh, adopt those uh, those uh, those apps. And another question, which is more a legal question, but which comes back to uh, uh, Michel Foucault and the surveillance state. Um, I do, well, for some cases, it's based on the consent. And uh, I think Adria mentioned the fact that they should definitely not be compulsory, uh, compulsory systems, but so, Based on the consent, can we actually consider that my consent is a free consent when either there is such a social pressure around the fact that this needs to be adopted really widely for the system to function, or even worse, and it's been seen, uh, the fact of not adopting and having the app uh, would actually restrict my freedom of movement. Can in that case my consent be considered free? So I give the floor back to you, and thank you again. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, I want to say a couple of quick words on that. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Obviously, a challenge with um, the high international conventions and this particular issue is just how fast things are moving on the ground. And I think regulators in practice are unwilling to, to place their way, place themselves in the way of, of issues or even enforce data protection by design. I was heartened to see this morning the European Data Protection Board come out and say that a decentralized version 
of this approach is is is, uh, is more in line with that principle. However, on, your consent point is really important here, and we have to consider the political economy of these things. One reason why um, I do have concerns uh, about uh, what Dino was presenting is because in an ideal world, I think it sounds great, but in the world we live in, if you ask people to self-monitor on their devices, this becomes an extremely uh, uh, valuable thing for governments to access and to put legal requirements on you to provide, whether you're uh, an immigrant worker and you're then told it's normalized that you track yourself and that you produce this data, or that you provide this data uh, in times of emergency. We see this in the UK with mobile phone booths that police operate to extract data locally from mobile phones. Um, so I think these things do need to be considered because the side, you know, privacy by design also has to be resistant against the political economy side of it. Um, so that's why in, in the approach we, we designed, uh, it was resistant to that. And even if somebody accesses your phone, that does not mean that they can, they can learn a huge amount about you. Um, but I am very aware, and I think I, I agree with Dino, it does help to, to, to you know, use technology as an aid to help contact tracers in all these situations. Um, one last thing to say, which is interesting, anonymization to, to, you know, to, to the other point that was raised about anonymization standards. Um, in, in our system, we, we yeah, I, I mean, I, I work as a data protection law academic, so I do understand the case law around this, and I think this is really key. We're not promoting false anonymization in the cloud. This is, this is serious privacy engineering. This is not cookies pretending they're not personal data. Um, for cookie identifiers. So this is all um, comes together, but I, I agree strongly with uh, with Dino that we have to bear in mind what you know, what is useful to people on the ground, but equally have to bear in mind that we don't just uh, create new vectors that can be misused with law, because realistically data protection does not stop the kind of uh, powers that governments are, are seeking to use now uh, in a way that we might like it to. Thanks, uh, um, Dino, maybe do you have something to add Absolutely, absolutely. First of all, because I, I believe that you know the privacy by design approach is the core of, of what we're talking about. And we're, we're precisely talking about how to develop a privacy preserving approach that can be useful to the purpose of, of uh, you know contrasting the epidemics. And that's precisely the kind of approach that I, I, I advocate very much. You know, one line of uh, little disagreement with, 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 with Michael, but I think it's more in the, let's say, in the, in the narrative rather than in the, in, the, in the essence, is that, you know, I mean, I believe that we should uh, begin to think about our, uh, you know, digital society and the rights we do have in, in a world that is not only analog, but also digital, should not be somehow uh, compressed by the current state of technology. I mean, technology, is not the, the end, it, it, it's a mean. Even if, it, even if it seems so pervasive today, we should not devise our institution on the basis of what technology can deliver to us today, right? Because what technology delivers to us today is simply the, 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 uh, the end and the, the consequence of a lot of economic pressure of you know, uh, powers that are fighting to each other, so it's not let's say, the normal outcome of what, uh, you know, the digital should be, but it's simply, you know, the, the, a very imperfect and primitive situation brought from the battle of powers up to now. I mean, we have the, in our generation, I, I, as the, somehow the, 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 the task of defining what are the democratic principles of a digital society, which is inherently different from what we were inhabiting before, exactly for the data, exactly for the fact that a digital society is like an analogic society, plus the fact that everything can be possibly recorded. And the key question of my point of view is who records this? And the, and the answer to this question is not the governments, the companies, the corporation, but it's the people. It's the individual people recording the data concerning herself or himself in a safe way, in a way that cannot be stolen, cannot be somehow uh, by, any, by, by anybody, by corporations or by governments. And this is the basic of a democratic interaction between citizens and the collective uh, institutions and the markets and, uh, and the companies. Okay, and I, I mean, this is, a, a, I believe, is our aim. Uh, whether technology does not allow us to have this dream uh, already in place, I mean, it's just a, a requirement that, that the democratic society should push towards technology because it is devised 
in a human way and not in a, in a let's say, a, a corporate uh, dependent or government dependent way. And, and that's why I really believe that we need to strive for a solution that is not hacking a solution for every specific problem. No? Uh, I like very much the, D, the DP3T solution for contact tracing. Uh, it's a very uh, in, interesting, uh, let's say, privacy preserving solution, but it's a hack. It's, not a, a, it's a hack for a problem, right? And instead we need uh, uh, something different from a hack for a problem. We need a way to deal with the issues of a, of a democratic society in the digital age under emergencies, like the one we are, we are discussing. And so we, we really need to discuss about principles. But one final uh, observation I wanted to stress about uh, uh, an interesting point of the conversation. Uh, one thing that is uh, important of the solution that we are discussing, including the DP3 solution for contact tracing, is that they are absolutely opt-in solution, right? In the sense that it, when you re receive, you are participating in the game, first of all, and you know that participating in the game may mean that you sometimes we, re we receive a message, a private message from you from the system, not from, the, from an authority, telling you were close enough to a, a person that was tested positive, it's up to you to, to decide what to do next, whether you show up at the health authority and get tested and enter the or not okay so it's truly a participatory game and i think this is uh, uh, an important part of the of the of the solution that we're discussing about thanks a lot dino and to conclude adrien maybe you have some also uh, maybe thought about that adrien the floor is yours sure um, I'm uh, really fascinated by uh, DP3T, actually. Uh, I, I believe decentralization and privacy by design are keys, and, and it's, a great, um, it's great that such initiative exists. Uh, th thank you, uh, Michael, and your colleagues to work uh, on this project. Um, some countries, unfortunately, will sadly not implement such standards. Um, putting this aside, I I'm less concerned about the app in itself than the context in which the app will be deployed. Let me give you examples. Uh, when I hear a famous French journalist say this week that it will be a consent basis, uh, it will be on a consent basis, and people that will use uh, the app will be the first to benefit from some serology testing, I don't hear the real voluntary basis. I hear a, a social pressure. Uh, when I hear a leading voice in the startup ecosystem explaining that we, the main goal of even an open source and decentralized app is to send names of people to governments so that they can be put into quarantine. I believe also there is a, here also there should be some kind of clarification uh, on the context. So um, to, to answer your question, Sophie, uh, I, I think it should not be mandatory, and I agree with Dino on that point. As far as discrimination, for instance, is concerned, I believe the use of such app will never be mandatory, neither by government nor by private parties. Otherwise, you have new forms of discrimination that will emerge, for instance, when accessing physical spaces like a grocery store, when going to work, or if someone is being refused government benefits because uh, she or he hasn't uh, installed the app. So um, it should be based on another, uh, it, sh it should be based on a legal basis, uh, like uh, the GDPR approach, but the, the, the huge risk is that, and actually like in other sectors, consents will not be free because of the social pressure you talked about. Thank you very much um, to our three experts for their answers. Um, we'll now start a second round of questions. And uh, for this purpose, I'll give the floor to Clementina Barbaro, who's from the Secretariat of the Council of Europe. So, Clementina, you have the floor. So, thank you very much, uh, Juliette. I would like to thank uh, warmly the experts uh, for their very enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, you just uh, mentioned uh, that um, I am uh, responsible for the Secretariat support uh, to the CAHAI, the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence of uh, the Council of Europe, uh, uh, which is currently working uh, on uh, the development of a legal framework on artificial intelligence. And uh, we all think uh, that uh, uh, the current circumstances uh, uh, certainly confirm uh, the importance of uh, the elaboration uh, of a comprehensive 
and also, I would say, an effectively implementable legal framework on AI, including in times of emergency, uh, we, 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 we can see that it is very likely that AI and uh, digital technologies will, will be certainly more used uh, in the future. We hope uh, that uh, this, they will be not misused, but uh, of course, uh, this is uh, what uh, a legal framework in principle uh, should, uh, should prevent. So, um, I would like to go back uh, to an issue which uh, was already raised uh, in the debate and which is uh, the technology on which uh, uh, contact tracing applications are based. So, in most cases, this is not AI. Uh, we know that uh, there is a resort to GPS technology or even Bluetooth. For instance, like in the uh, DP Treaty uh, application, contact tracing application uh, to which uh, reference was made earlier. And uh, so, my question to the experts concerns uh, the limits of this technology, and in particular, to which extent can we trust it? Uh, bearing in mind that there are uh, growing concerns uh, on the large number of false positives that uh, this technology can create. So, I can give you a, an example which was uh, broadly uh, referred to by, by the media, by public sources, um, which, uh, in fact, uh, for this, uh, uh, you know, the fact that I could uh, ping the Bluetooth of uh, my neighbor, uh, my home neighbor was just a few steps away from me, uh, so the Bluetooth would detect him, but in fact, there would be a wall separating us, and we would not be really in contact, even though the certainly proximity event would be recorded by the Bluetooth application. So, this could be in reality even counterproductive in a perspective of uh, prevention of COVID-19. It could give a false indication, uh, and then my, perhaps my neighbor would get uh, concerned and worried and uh, would, I don't know, call the hospitals or the emergency services to, 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 to ask, uh, you know, some, to ask for help. So, my question to the experts is really, uh, how, do, how can we address this? How we could pre prevent the rise of uh, the number of false positives which is generated by this technology? Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Marina. Um, so, technology question. I think we'll turn first to Michael Veal and then to the other experts. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer quickly so we've got enough time. Um, like with any technology, this is going to be a difficult thing to manage. We in our team have built in lots of mitigations for these kind of attacks. So, some people worried about drive-by attacks where you, you affect a lot of people. These are now no longer possible in our system. Our system has to hear a very long set of keys before it can figure out the real key. Um, uh, when we're talking about through a wall, I agree there are times where that can be a problem. We're still working on if we can fully mitigate this, but these walls we understand also have to be quite thin plasterboard. You have to be quite close between them for about 15 minutes of the phones being close. So it's not as um, terrible as people are making out, but that does not mean these are not problems. So we, the, 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 the point is that these will always be first versions and there will always be challenges. Um, people can also turn off these, uh, these Bluetooth pings or choose times that they're not going to re the release when they were infected. Uh, those are also possible um, in our system. Uh, so there are lots of mitigations, but we also don't want to take an engineering mindset and over-engineer before we've seen it iteratively with society. So we can try and preempt some of these problems, but there's no way that we can preempt them all. Um, and and uh, yeah, so th these have to be, uh, this is an experiment. There's huge political demand for this. This is going to happen regardless of whether people choose our protocol or not. Uh, and all we can do is steer it to a view where it is more privacy friendly, but also hopefully people are aware that this is a first trial. There will be rockiness at the beginning because we can't promise that there won't be. Uh, but, but hopefully we can, uh, we can mitigate these and find in even more ways to, to mitigate more as we continue. Thank you, Michael. Um, Dino, would you like to add something to this answer? Yes? Please. Yeah, uh, uh, very quickly, another, another observation. I do agree with, with Michael. Uh, I would also add that, uh, consider that what we are trying to, to do with this, with this uh, content trade is, it, again, expanding the ability of focusing 
tests on a, a population that is more likely to be positive rather than others. So remember that the key, the key objective is that we cannot test for the entire population. That would be the, the best, right? Make a test to everybody, but it's not, not doable. The point is that how to focus the testing capacity in a, in a way that it's uh, as able as possible to somehow spot the, the real positive, right? And, to, to, and actually, even the, the tests has some, you know, issues with, with the specificity and accuracy, I mean, by, by itself. But the point is that this is the, the, the game we are trying to do. So, I mean, uh, alert a person that, uh, yeah, it was under a wall. The, uh, that it will be probably be tested for 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 nothing. It's still you know doable, and it's not a social stigma because the person is being contacted anonymously. So I I don't see this as a really a major point. The, the, the major point is to be as effective as possible to test effectively the population to stop uh, the, uh, the the positive circulation as early as possible, and. <clears throat> Also, uh, remember that in, in, in this is actually as a way of uh, pursuing this goal is less intrusive uh, compared to what people uh, do in the real uh, in real life. I mean, in real life, uh, the, the epidemiologists would ask the surveillance person would ask the positive, "Who are your contacts?" and uh, by name and surname, and they would be contacted one after the other. So, in a sense, this is uh, a way to amplify this this uh, this part with other possible people that might have been in contact uh, unaware unawarelessly so i mean it's a uh, acceptable kind of intrusion thank you very much dino um i wonder if uh, adrian would like to add something um lots have been already said actually but um, um of course there are risks um and of course the need to protect digital rights um, is not something new uh, but I'd like to add something. I, I think it's also a fantastic opportunity for citizens to fully grasp this uh, societal issue. It is a really important moment because we have often lack narratives and we have often lack story to tell around digital world, which remains for a lot of people some kind of intangible reality. Uh, of course, we had... Um, you know, uh, Snowden with the NSA, Max Schrems with the privacy he shield, uh, we had uh, Christopher Wiley and uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. But those moments count among the rare stories that have been discussed by the general public. And, and it's a shame, and it's a shame that we need, we always need disaster, we always need, uh, I mean, like a crisis to happen to take into account such um, issues. So now is another moment, so let's make the best out of it. I think it's a really important moment for that public debate around, you know, core, core, core fundamental freedoms and digital rights issues. Thanks a lot, uh, Adrien, and to the other experts also for this set of, of questions. I saw that Claudia wants to ask a question. We are just uh, organizing the, que the question with Livia. Claudia, if you allow me, I just give the floor first to Livia and then to you. Uh, Livia uh, Stoika is uh, also the other co-secretary of the CAHI, and I would like to let her the floor. Thank you, Yannick, and uh, I'd like to join my thanks uh, also um, with my colleagues for the excellent presentations um, of the experts, as they have been touching upon the key issues of concern for the um, of the work of the ad hoc committee for the right uh, of the ad hoc committee. On artificial intelligence. Um, now, I'd like perhaps to touch upon a specific issue, um, which is obviously the complex relationship between surveillance and democracy, and the concern that we all share that the management of the COVID-19 pandemic will actually shape the future of surveillance enabled by AI. Now, obviously, in our work um, of the CAHI for the development of a legal framework uh, and for the development of pan-European standards or even global standards uh, for AI, we, we need to take into account and address a, need, a number of concerns upon which I think all three presentations have uh, we equally touched upon. Um, one of them is obviously the concerns that the tools that are being developed uh, are having uh, perhaps the authoritarian habit of surveillance quite baked into their design. 
We are also concerned about their use, their misuse, and especially about the long-term, potential long-term use and impact, and how this surveillance could actually damage democracy. Um, so perhaps I'd like to, to have a question which touches both on the technological dimension, both in terms of design and use, but also on the legal uh, framework implications uh, on for which we are actually um, uh, conducting our work. How can we really ensure that these tools uh, do not make individuals get used to massive surveillance methods and relinquish voluntarily their individual rights? And I know that Sophie's question has touched a bit on the notion of free consent, but if perhaps you could elaborate uh, slightly more on that. And uh, looking at the legal dimension and the pan-European standards that we are developing, how can we actually ensure that uh, the gaps that are being identified uh, at this moment in time um, should be actually um, properly identified and addressed? And if perhaps uh, the last speaker could also build a little bit more on um, what standards uh, have been identified as lacking. I mean, I, I understand from, uh, from the presentation earlier on that although we've been talking about anonymity, nothing is really anonymous, and obviously there may be further work uh, to be done in this area. But there are obviously other dimensions that we would like to look at in this context. Non-discrimination was was early addressed. But if we could uh, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on on what should be the focus of our concern for pan-European standards for for AI in this context. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Olivia. And because we are running late, I'm just checking the time also. Claudia, maybe you can raise your point or question now also if you want. And we will give the floor to the expert just after. Thank you, Patrick. My question is more about, somebody said about the sense, to make sure we have a real sense that we can tell citizens what they're engaging for. And from that perspective, I have a question about the, uh, the use of this, um, of this app. What happens to asymptomatic carriers uh, that are, of course, responsible for much of the spreading? Uh, how can they be accounted for? And because uh, they're so numerous, wouldn't a random type um, testing tracing be much more effective than trying to catch every single um, citizen? Because that would uh, require to be really effective uh, testing the entire population. We know that's very difficult. So I have a question about the the essence and whether epidemiologists um, would be uh, more content with uh, something that gave them that kind of information rather than tracing the single individual with also the problem that uh, Clementina raised about the false, uh, because we're relying very much on the, on the solidity of testing, which we know is not 100% guaranteed. So all the, how do you square all these difficulties and this question brings me to the fact that this conversation um, needs to include the epidemiologists because we're doing this for a purpose. They are at the uh, requesting side. And then there is a receiving end, which is public authorities, uh, um, health institutions. So for me, the, this discussion, while extremely interesting, lacks um, other partners in order to provide what Dino says, the uh, true sense and the trust because citizens are only going to be trusting this if they know that it's not some app that is being designed by whoever, however reliable and, and, and well done. They're going to trust it if they know that the information that they're voluntarily giving has a sense. Where is it going to? What purpose would it serve? Would it be for scientists? Would it be for public authorities to decide what restrictions, etc.? So I think there needs to be a full dimension of this conversation for me in order to understand the true implications and therefore the trade-offs that you have so uh, so well and clearly explained. Thank you. Michael, please, the floor is yours. For both those questions. Um, so firstly, on the what we've done to build in uh, to resist function creep and what could be done in the future. These are very important questions. Uh, so one of the things the, the, that we've done to build in, in particular in this instance, which, as Dina says, is a hack at the moment, uh, that's, I, personally, I think that's all we can respond to. I think a crisis is a very bad time to build institutions and to make a big, you know, considered change. Um, but we can, of course, learn from it. Um, uh, what we've done is a couple of things. Uh, the, firstly, uh, it may seem arcane, 
But a very important part is that the identifiers, the random identifiers, are decided randomly on your device. So this means that if it, it, you know, some systems give you what they say is a random identifier to, to send out to the world from a server. They say, send out this one, please. And they might say this is random, but one day it might not be random. One day it might be chosen. And, and so it can extend in that direction. The way our system is designed, it cannot extend in that direction. That is the that is the the uh, you know, one of the ways we we stop surveillance linking to persistent identifiers that can be creeping in that way. However, um, this is of course not enough because surveillance is also about how you can use power, not just how you can use data to understand people. Um, and and so what I would suggest um, for uh, for thinking about this in the future, and one thing Council of Europe might want to consider, are things like a right to repair or a right to refuse participation in a protocol. Um, you know, privacy enhancing technologies are very powerful, but as we've shown, you can make a system that, that can risk score people in a totally anonymous way. You know, that is the point of it. Mathematically, it is, you know, it is not a fake anonymous way. It is a, something that can exercise something. It can, it, can, it can apply a risk score that power can be exercised on the basis of in a wholly anonymous way. This means that data protection that bases itself on personal data is not enough. You need also the right to be able to refuse to participate in a computation. You need the right to be able to repair a device and not have a change to your operating system that you did not consent to. Um, this is more like e-privacy in European law about any kind of interference with your terminal device. So that's very important to retain. Lastly, um, on asymptomatic people and epidemiologists. Um, asymptomatic people, I agree, there's not enough testing, but we can't test the entire population constantly. So you need a combination. That's what I, I'm just channeling the epidemiologists we work with here. I know they should, probably should be in the conversation, but that's all I can do. Um, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but I can say what they told me. Um, uh, you know, randomized testing, sampling is great to start start to seed the, the, the trickle down. So you can say, oh, this person, now we know has got it. Now we can trace where they are. And then something like an app might help to be able to, to basically amplify the power of those limited number of tests. Um, and that's the point of, of uh, contact tracing in general. So you can then target your tests in a way that's not random because you're targeting with a good chance of finding people who you can then trace further. Um, with epidemiologists, I agree they should be in the room. I also know that they are under a huge amount of pressure and demand. Uh, and so we work closely with them in our project. I hope other people uh, do too more broadly around the world. Um, and, uh, and that's key to have them. But not only them, as we develop these things, representatives from all parts of society, but it's very hard to do that in our current situation at the speed we're working at, having to deliver things um, and to try and make a difference. Thanks, Michael. Do you know? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, only only very quickly on the on this final part. Yes, you know, by, by working side by side with the with the epidemiologist, you see very clearly that, uh, of course, that you, you are also it's also important to conduct large scale random random uh, testing to understand better, for instance, the incidence of there. There are a number of parameters about this uh, new disease that are not known yet. For instance, if you want to understand the incidence, the the, the speed at which the, the the disease spreads, in in you need to go for for random tests over uh, repeated over time. And, and but but uh, for what concern when you want actually want to uh, do the fireman work I was talking about you really need to go to to, to individual uh, hopefully few positive tests trace back the, the transmission chains and you know simply uh, stop the fire you no know, that, that's what and you need to to do this in the most effective possible way you can simply do it uh, with you know asking people and and with the work of uh, the firemen on the ground. Or, or you can try to somehow empower uh, more this this uh, this, uh, this uh, um, activity also using digital instruments. Of course, this must be done uh, once again in a truly participatory way. And I come to the to the, to the question by Olivia. I think it's it's very important. I believe that uh, also uh, it was uh, also said before by by uh, Andrian. So we have really a, a fantastic way of somehow showing for real people how participating in a game together can uh, be, help reach a common a common good with uh, with an incredibly effective uh, uh, let's say result. Uh, and this can it's a shame that this is done only by an emergent because this could work for ordinary life. 
for many other challenges we face. But so we, we should really stress the fact that uh, it is a voluntary experiment. And if we are, uh, you know, a, a large enough number, we can be very helpful to somehow uh, create a collective, uh, uh, you know, in, in important result for every for everybody. How not to get used to being overexposed to that? Because this is a very interesting question. Uh, and I think it's very much linked to aware participation. We are participating again with a purpose, with a minimal collection of information. Most of it actually is not even collected because it's totally, you know, anonymous and left to the to the to the protocols. If any other information is collected, like it is by the the, the epidemiologists on the ground, of, of course, the epidemiology on the ground register the cases, geolocate it, and use it for the everything will be forgotten as soon as possible as the emergency is over. So we need somehow to be uh, 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 somehow very well informed about uh, voluntary participation to again with a purpose, with a beginning and an end, with, with completely clear engagement rules for what we are donating and what we are receiving in exchange, and, and uh, both as individuals and, and, and as a collective. And this is the way, in my, in my opinion, to to tell the story, um, which is democratic engagement in, of people in, in, a, in, a, in a common goal. For a thanks, Dino. Thanks, Dino. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Adrien, a very short answer because, again, we are running late. Thanks, Adrien. Okay, so the effectiveness of the technological tools we are discussing today has not been evaluated yet. And we have seen how the deployment of big data tracking, for instance, uh, during the Ebola outbreak could lead to the violation of uh, people's rights while doing very little to combat the disease. So as a consequence, I agree with the question that has been raised. It is the responsibility of scientists and in particular of epidemiologists to uh, beforehand, that is before deploying any of these apps, guarantee that it would be useful in reducing the number of infections. Um, the second point, and to end by this note, I think this crisis is qualified as a state of exception, and in number of countries, emergency law uh, have been or are going to be enacted. And of course, no one seriously questions the need to protect public health and safety, but which should respect human rights, um, because history tends to show that um, exception to civil liberties protection made in a time of crisis, and I agree uh, with Michael, I think crisis is a bad timing to build institutions, uh, often remain much longer after this crisis. And, and I agree also with uh, Dino when he talks about the beginning and, and the end. Um, uh, this is um, the, the question, the crucial question of temporality. We must define, and I will conclude by that, and we must plan in advance that uh, the, what are the criteria to determine the end of the health emergency. In other words, at what point should exceptional measures put in place during a crisis be lifted and when to reactivate exceptional measures to prevent a new epidemic and in the meantime should the collected data be retained and if so by whom and under what conditions so if we do not answer those questions we could very well uh, live in a permanent state of exception and the 21st century could be a state of permanent crisis Thanks a lot, Adrien. It will be time to, to conclude. Uh, just, Michael, I received from you just a, a little notice about a possible legislation. Just maybe uh, in one minute, if you can say a last word about, about that. Yeah, um, so we're very worried about the way these technologies, despite being private, can be misused. So in the UK, we, myself and some other academics, have drafted a bill uh, that actually says you, you cannot mandate these things you cannot refuse people entry on the basis of risk or without due safeguards and so on. And, and this is a constant work in progress, but I'm happy to send the link afterwards. This is all open and we're all happy to take feedback. People are interested in other countries and it would be good to think of what structure of provisions could, um, could limit the, the use of these, not just the use of the data. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Great, Michael, thanks a lot. And of course, we will publish with this webinar uh, some links on our uh, internet website. You will have all the full information on social media, etc., how to find these links. So, Juliette, I think it's time to conclude now.